virtual, pero el indirecto, cómo los capacitamos para que también puedan servir de apoyo. Porque miren, la tendencia está marcada, ya lo vimos aquí, hay una tendencia muy marcada a que el número de estudiantes de todas las universidades eh, ha tenido opciones en educación a distancia en términos de al menos un curso en línea. Y hablamos de al menos un curso en línea, pero hay estudiantes que tienen dos, que tienen tres, eh, y que quizás hacen un híbrido en sus programas de clase, y este semestre a lo mejor hasta optaron por tomar todos sus cursos en línea, aunque no están en un programa a distancia. Y entonces, cuando hablamos de... Esto está un poquito lento de cómo trabajamos el asunto de calidad, que lo hemos eh, de alguna manera expresado en, en todo lo que hemos hablado, incluyendo el doctor Morales. Hablamos también de lo que tiene que ver con, por ejemplo, eh, y el doctor Morales lo, lo mencionó ahorita, estándares de calidad. Hay unos estándares de calidad que son un compromiso institucional y que son indelegables. Que más allá de que se muestren en situaciones, que, en organizaciones que acreditan o en eh, organizaciones que licencian, como es el caso de, de Puerto Rico, son, es un compromiso institucional que tenemos. Es decir, sí hay un, un nivel de cumplimiento, pero hay un nivel de un compromiso institucional con ese estudiante eh, que confió en nosotros para estar allí y que evidentemente va a ser nuestra mejor carta de, de presentación al momento de graduarse eh, de un programa. Como sabrán, un estudiante que estudia a distancia no dice en su, en su eh, diploma que su programa a distancia. Así que hay un compromiso de que la calidad sea eh, igual, tanto en un programa presencial como en un programa a distancia. Por lo tanto, no subestimemos ninguna de las dos modalidades. Son opciones que una universidad tiene para ofrecerle a un estudiante, ya sea que puede o no puede llegar, eh, por las razones que sean, a un campus universitario. Y... Eh, les hablaba de los estándares ¿verdad? institucionales, en este caso hay normativas que nos rigen en términos de lo que es la preparación de la facultad, cuán preparados están, ya no solo en su disciplina, sino también en la modalidad en que van a estudiar. Eh, estándares de calidad también que nosotros adoptamos a nivel externo, ¿verdad? y yo me imagino que los que están aquí bastante relacionados con lo que es educación en línea han escuchado de Quality Matters, que tiene que ver con los criterios para diseño instruccional, que también lo mencionó el doctor Morales. Regulaciones federales. Presumo que a la señora que dice aquí que se llama Sara, todo el mundo la conoce, el, por lo menos el que está familiarizado con educación a distancia. ¿Quién la conoce? Ok. Muy conocida entre nosotras también, ¿verdad? Eh, para beneficio de los que no la conocen, ¿verdad? Es, es una organización que nos ayuda a tener cumplimiento, para, para un poco explicárselo bastante sencillo. Eh, hay una regulación federal que establece que nosotros estamos obligados a tener una autorización, lo digo entre comillas porque pudiera ser una carta, pudiera ser el proceso que establezca el Estado. Eh, tenemos que tener esa autorización del Estado donde reside el estudiante. Eh, y como sabrán, tenemos un número significativo de Estado y un número significativo de estudiantes que no están en Puerto Rico. Si a eso le sumamos que los estudiantes también se mueven con una facilidad bastante frecuente, ¿verdad? Eh, y entonces, ¿cómo nosotros nos aseguramos de ese cumplimiento? Así que eh, esta organización vino un poco a ayudarnos en, esta, en esa gestión y de cómo nosotros, que tenemos el compromiso de seguir con un programa a distancia, eh, muy firme, muy serio, eh, a tener también cumplimiento con esta regulación federal. Ya eh, Puerto Rico pudo ingresar y por consiguiente, pues nosotros como instituciones eh, universitarias o instituciones de educación superior pudimos ingresar de tal forma de que también estemos eh, en cumplimiento. Pero también parte de lo que se requiere es el cumplimiento de todo lo que nos piden las otras agencias, tanto a nivel de Puerto Rico como a nivel federal. En el caso... Déjenme voltearme un poquito acá. En el caso de los niveles, para asegurar lo que es la calidad, ¿verdad? Tenemos, eh, quisimos mostrarlo en, en tres dimensiones. A nivel institucional, ¿verdad? Que ya les hablé que son políticas, procedimientos que se establecen. A nivel de campus es cómo nosotros establecemos procesos para atender a estos estudiantes y cómo... Eh, Cómo establecemos también procesos a nivel de cumplimiento, que ya yo creo que es una palabra que todo para nosotros es bastante eh, frecuente dentro de nuestras conversaciones o dentro de, de, de nuestras intervenciones en nuestras universidades. Y en el caso de a nivel de departamentos, ¿verdad? Como esto lo vemos en el caso del de, eh, diseño de programas 
el diseño de cursos en línea, eh, cómo entonces lo, eh, lo hacemos realidad. En el caso de la facultad, que decíamos ahorita, la asignación de facultad, el desarrollo de facultad y cómo aseguramos que esa facultad se mantenga actualizada para atender esta población estudiantil, para saber que la pedagogía virtual requiere de otras estrategias que no necesariamente puedan ser homologables a las que se utilizan en un salón presencial. Y el cumplimiento, ¿verdad?, en términos de lo que es el estudiante. Podemos tener las mejores intenciones, eh, pueden estar dentro de nuestros planes estratégicos, que el que sí es necesario tener educación a distancia porque hay que atender una necesidad de un estudiante que no puede llegar al recinto, pero también tenemos que saber que hay unos niveles de cumplimiento, que hay unos niveles de integridad, que hay unos niveles ¿verdad? De, de, eh, de establecer estándares altos de calidad para que este estudiante tenga el mejor desarrollo académico posible y que eventualmente eh, su diploma también diga, yo me gradué de un programa eh, íntegro, de un programa que eh, realmente me dio las bases para aprender, para poderme desempeñar luego que yo vaya a ejercer eh, ese grado académico. En el caso del diseño de cursos en línea también está como parte de una normativa, eh, se basa en una necesidad, luego que se identifican estas necesidades, por ejemplo, de programas, eh, y esto lo hace la facultad, claro, hay un apoyo administrativo, hay un apoyo técnico que está mano a mano con ellos, eh, diseñadores instruccionales, videógrafos, eh, personas que... Eh, trabajan en, en desarrollo de, de, de áreas web, de tal forma que podamos tener equipos de trabajo que apoyen la gestión eh, de la disciplina, ¿verdad? El profesor es especialista en su materia. Hay algunos que se han hecho especialistas a nivel eh, tecnológico, ya sea creando materiales multimedios o, ¿verdad? O, o, o montando incluso materiales dentro de la plataforma educativa. Pero, ¿cómo hacemos sentir que ese profesor está acompañado de nosotros, de tal forma que podamos tenerlo de regreso, que no sea una sola vez el que esté diseñando un curso en línea y que el día de mañana también se sienta eh, cómodo en poder diseñar? Y eh, este es el, el, el ciclo, ¿verdad? Hay una rúbrica de diseño instruccional ya establecida dentro de lo que es la política institucional, eh, hay un, un diseño y una revisión de diseño instruccional. Esto no necesariamente el profesor que, que tiene a cargo el diseño del contenido es especialista en, en diseño instruccional. Por lo tanto, nosotros tenemos a alguien que lo va a ayudar a que realmente eh, los objetivos estén alineados con todo el contenido que diseñó, lo que dice el prontuario, etc. En el caso también eh, de una revisión, de un, de, de, de un par de él, ¿verdad? Eh, el que sea un experto en materia. Si es un curso de matemática, que tengamos a un segundo, de tal forma que ese segundo pueda ver ese diseño de ese contenido. Y ojo aquí, sabemos que todos los profesores a nivel, y todos los profesionales, tenemos nuestro estilo. Así que en este proceso nosotros cuidamos que esa revisión no caiga en una revisión de estilo, sino que caiga en una revisión de juicio académico, pedagógico, es decir, eh, de diseño instruccional, de que esté alineado, de cuál es la experiencia de un profesor también, si realmente la forma en que está establecido se puede entender, si hay alguna experiencia de ese profesor que en el pasado, gracias, en el pasado tuvo alguna experiencia eh, que lo hizo de esa manera y quizás no llegó, y quizás entonces hubo una necesidad de hacer un, una transformación de esa estrategia, pues ese es el proceso que se da aquí. Y, por supuesto, el montaje del curso, que aquí entran lo que son los administradores de plataforma. Y este último es un proceso cíclico, ¿verdad? Porque de primera intención hay como una validación en ese primer curso. Está el feedback, el, la retroalimentación no solo del profesor, sino también de los estudiantes. Pero es un proceso que continúa, o sea, que no, no termina allí. Si en el siguiente semestre se identifica algo, es un proceso que se sigue enriqueciendo. Quería compartirles también algo que, eh, poco para finalizar, y, y es parte de lo que ambos hemos hablado. Lecciones aprendidas, y se las voy, se, les enumeré algunas de ellas para un poco, salud, para un poco eh, compartirlas con ustedes. Número uno, la educación a distancia no es una moda. 
no te pones una chaqueta, no te pones un pantalón, no utilizas un color de, una misma, de un mismo estilo, eh, no es una moda, es un compromiso firme de una institución universitaria seria eh, que tiene que cumplir con esas personas que confiaron en nosotros. O sea, que más allá de un cumplimiento con las agencias que nos licencian y nos acreditan, que sí es importante, hay un compromiso fuerte con ese estudiante que optó por estar con nosotros y no irse a otro lugar. Por lo tanto, es un compromiso de nosotros de atender sus necesidades, de velar por las cosas que realmente eh, son, son importantes en su vida universitaria. Reconocer el compromiso que se asume al incorporar la educación a distancia en su oferta académica, en sus planes estratégicos. Ofrecer servicios de calidad ágiles y apropiados. Asegurar el contar con la infraestructura necesaria para atender a esta población, ya sea administrativa a nivel de recursos humanos, ya sea fiscal y tecnológica. Ofrecer mentoría y adiestramientos continuos, tanto a la facultad, a los estudiantes cuando es necesario y al personal de apoyo. Asegurar un nivel de interacción adecuado entre, dentro de los cursos. Evaluar continua y apropiadamente los cursos, los programas y los procesos. Quizás no necesariamente lo que estás haciendo hoy te va a funcionar mañana. Así que debemos tener apertura a esos cambios. Y reestructurar cuando sea necesario estos procesos que impactan grandemente la gestión de lo que es la educación a distancia y que evidentemente le van a garantizar el éxito o no de esa gestión universitaria. Hasta aquí mi intervención. Muchísimas gracias. Preguntas, es decir, el doctor Morales tiene a bien acompañarme acá, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta. Gracias. Sí, buenos días. Yo buenos tengo días. una pregunta, yo soy un estudiante, estoy tomando ahora un programa a distancia, ya. completamente a distancia, y, y es una observación a ver cómo, cómo se puede trabajar, ¿verdad?, eh, los foros como herramientas de, de eh, pedagógica. Uh -huh. Mi experiencia con los foros en este año y medio que he estado estudiando a distancia en una de las instituciones en Puerto Rico, no voy a decir el nombre, pues no uh -huh. ha sido uno, no ha sido un evento positivo en la pedagógicamente hablando, uh -huh. desde la perspectiva de que los foros se han convertido en o en asignaciones uh -huh. en vez de foros de interacción y la interacción de la facultad en los foros ha sido cero. De los, yo le puedo decir que de veintipico de créditos que he tomado, ni un profesor ha escrito un comentario en ninguno de los foros. Okay. Eh, ¿Cómo las instituciones pueden, si van a utilizar esa metodología, eh, monitorear o qué tipo de, de trabajo se pudiese hacer para que, aunque el diseño esté hecho para que se den unas cosas, ese tipo de, ese tipo de proceso sea uno eh, eficiente para los nosotros los estudiantes. Segundo, porque en, y, no, y es compartido en algunos de nuestros compañeros que yo tengo, que también eh, toman en otras institu en algunas otras instituciones, no es la que yo estoy, eh, yo nunca he visto una foto de ninguno de mis profesores en línea. Okay. O sea, ¿cómo yo puedo relacionarme con alguien si yo no lo puedo ver? No sé quién es, ni tengo noción de cómo se ve, claro. pero a la misma vez nos exigen que nos presentemos y nos mm. pongamos. O sea, que ¿cómo podemos establecer y cómo las instituciones, ya sea, ¿verdad?, tomando los ejemplos de, de otras instituciones, se dé ese proceso? Y esa es mi pregunta. Muy bien. Sí. Es excelente la intervención. Ahorita, yo no sé si pueden recordar, hice un énfasis en lo que tiene que ver con la, interac con, con la interacción y cómo realmente, qué es lo que busca un estudiante y esto él aquí no los ha validado. Eh, no busca hacer eh, medios o grupos sociales, busca interactuar con contenido con su profesor, eh, porque está allí por un curso. Eh, sí, como valor añadido, puede atender y puede lograr tener algunas amistades. Así que eh, la respuesta es la siguiente, esto es capacitación constante, evidentemente con la facultad, hay una necesidad de capacitación constante con la facultad y de cómo vemos lo que es eh, ¿verdad? esta participación dentro de lo que es el diseño instruccional, los foros de discusión. Sí le comparto, colega, que eh, por mucho tiempo parte de lo que se planteaba dentro de un diseño instruccional era establezcan foros, establezcan foros. Eh, y hasta qué punto quizás el establecer foro, no sé, no, no lo vimos, eh, no me quiero excluir, ¿verdad? Quiero ser parte de esto y parte de la solución. Eh, 
no lo vimos como algo que realmente tenemos que articularlo. No es tenerlos allí por tenerlos, no es porque pensamos que va a ser de esta manera y no lo evaluamos. Una de las cosas que le dije fue que hay que tener una evaluación constante de lo que ocurre dentro de los salones de clase virtuales. Así que esto es parte de los grandes retos y los desafíos que tiene una institución universitaria, y es uno solo. Eh, hay muchos otros que, que se presentan dentro de lo que es eh, la dinámica dentro de un curso en línea. ¿Cómo, cómo llevamos a este profesor a que realmente eh, pueda hacer un assessment continuo de que eh, hay algunas cosas, otra vez, no funcionaron ayer, pero mañana no. Incluso, esa misma estrategia podría funcionar con un grupo X y no con el, con el Y. O sea, que es, es parte de la responsabilidad. Eh, nos complace muchísimo que traiga este ejemplo ante, ante muchas universidades, de tal forma que nosotros también podamos ¿verdad? reforzar nuestros esfuerzos en ese sentido. Así que, si quizás la otra pregunta sí. para poderle... Eh, en español o en inglés, just very quickly... Um, I concur with um, Dr. Caraballo. Uh, training is key. The other element is also expectations. You know, if, if, if that is not stated and expected, it's very difficult to, to enforce. You know, it's, it's, difficult to it's, it's difficult to expect what you don't expect. Okay, so uh, that, that is key. And, and again, you know, it's an effort, it's a process. You don't do that overnight. There, are, there has to be a reasoning for those type of things. But the student is the customer, the client, and, and they demand and expect top quality uh, uh, because, you know, it's their future. So, any other questions? Tengo la segunda. Sí. Y en el caso de la segunda, también, tiene que ver con cómo llevamos a este profesor, porque quizás pudiera ser el caso que eh, un profesor entiende que no es necesario, ¿verdad? Y, y para otros estudiantes sí es necesario. Eh, sí le digo que a nivel de universidad sí tenemos ¿verdad? Eh, algunas estrategias en algunos de nuestros recintos que se establecen de cómo un estudiante puede saber cuál es el nombre del profesor. Eh, evidentemente no hay forma uno de garantizar de que todos estén en la misma línea en, en, en ninguna universidad, ¿verdad? Eh, pero sí es necesario, es parte de, de, la, de, de la capacitación que se le da a un miembro de facultad. En algunos casos se coloca incluso una página web, esta es nuestra facultad en línea. En otros casos, eh, el profesor, tanto como se le, se le requiere a los estudiantes, envían su presentación con su foto, eh, pero otra vez, es algo que también son áreas de crecimiento y que podemos también eh, seguir reforzando definitivamente. ¿Alguna otra? Si no hay más preguntas, el colega que estaba se nos retiró, ¿verdad? Fue el subió. Estaba por aquí, sí. Sí, estaba aquí. Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, le agradecemos muchísimo el que... Perfecto. Gracias a ustedes. Sí. Yubelkis. Let's take a photo. Now we have another concurrent session here that will start very soon. Yes, it's the signal. Yes, it's the signal. Let's take a photo from there, the two with the phone. We have to take the other presentation. Come on. Let's take a photo from there. Es para que nos tengan una foto. Ah, claro. Con el fondo. Ay, él lo está quitando, water, yo creo. Um, dile que me dé. Yeah. Dile que nos dé la. la a ver, el área de control, ¿podrías ponernos la, la primera, la portada rapidito? Prometemos avanzar. En lo que el próximo presentador sube. Perfecto. Karen will be, yeah. Okay. Host and presenters. Ah, pues vamos a ponerlo a estar en
contacto, claro que sí. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the HEADS Consortium, I would like to welcome you to the 2020 Best Practices Showcase, celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Victor Ray, and I will be in charge of introducing the speakers of the breaking sessions of this room. Although we'll be, we will have four questions at the end, the presenters will let you know whether you'll be able to address your questions at any time during the presentation. This presentation will be in, in English, a simultaneous translation will, will, is available in channel one and two. Additional headphones are available at the room or the registration area. We will appreciate that you change your mobile phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this session. Finally, please make sure you complete the evaluation form form for this session and had it before you leave this room. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to HEADS. Now, we are, ready, we are ready to start. The title of this presentation is, First Comes Technology in Identifying Hispanic and, and Latin Students in Need. Then comes Familia for Retention and Persistent Gains by Walter, Dr. Was, Walter Diaz and Mr. William Vicese from Eastern Connecticut State University. Well, it's, I think it's good afternoon now, so good afternoon and uh, thanks for hanging back to um, learn a little bit about um, the lessons we have learned at Eastern Connecticut State University that hoping that perhaps can be applied to your respective institution. Um, when Bill and I sat down, when we saw the call for proposals, um, we decided to submit a proposal that kind of fell under the retention track. And that's what we are going to present uh, this morning to you. So um, just a little bit about myself. I'm the Vice President of Student Affairs at Eastern Connecticut State University. I work primarily on the student service uh, side of the house. Uh, we are, uh, as part of my role, I oversee about 15 student service areas. The provost and academic affairs has some administrative units, but a lot of the departments and services outside of the classroom report uh, to my part of the organization. So a little bit, um, a little bit about, whoa. All right, so there we go. A little bit about Eastern Connecticut State University. We are a public institution located in Willimantic, Connecticut. We have about 5,000 students, about 4,200 are undergraduates. We're known uh, in Connecticut as the Connecticut's public liberal arts institution. 95% uh, of our students uh, reside in the state of Connecticut, although we're doing everything uh, everybody else is doing to try to recruit out of state and obviously we are increasing our presence here on the island in order to recruit more students to our institution. About 50% of our students are first generation students. We're highly residential with about 25 to 2600 students living on campus. Uh, 30%, 29 to 30% of our students are students of color and that number continues to increase on a yearly basis. About 60% of our students live on campus throughout the four years that they're at the, at the institution. So like many institutions, this is the incoming class last year. So during welcome weekend, uh, we gather all the students during orientation. Uh, we hoping that they, we can get them on the lawn to take a, a picture uh, as they, they don't know any better. They're 18 year olds, 19 year olds coming to campus. They're excited about coming to the institution. 
And then we as administrators think about, okay, out of these students, how many are gonna need help throughout their four years at the institution? We know uh, in working with college students today that a good number of these students are gonna need some assistance from faculty or student service area in some form or fashion throughout their four years at the institution. Obviously, we use, we try to use technology to the best of our ability to gather information for intervention and retention purposes. Uh, obviously, senior administrators are looking at the use of technology in different platforms in order to uh, intervene and work with our students throughout their four years in college. I will go over some of the platforms and technology that we're using currently at our institution uh, in order to intervene and try to uh, be uh, the best service to our students throughout the four years. A few years ago, um, some of my colleagues presented uh, at the HETS conference. We uh, developed over a years a predictive uh, um, model that was presented here and where we place students in four quadrants. That model is currently undergoing some revisions with some new variables and some new data. As a matter of fact, we just recently hired a dean of analytics to work and, and develop all kind of models uh, for our institution. My colleague Bill Bassesi, when he was on the academic affairs, uh, academic affairs side of the house, was very instrumental in developing uh, this Grades First uh, initiative where it was a platform of, with a vendor, right? Uh, some of this was built in-house. Some of the technology I'm going to touch on was built in-house and some using external vendors uh, was instrumental with Grades First. And that's used by the academic advisors and our faculty to issue f um, alerts uh, regarding attendance and um, you know, challenges with courses, uh, and you know, an alerts where the academic, ac academic advisors can go in to uh, intervene to assist some of these students. This platform was also shared with other stakeholders, stakeholders on campus. It was, uh, uh, you know, our residence directors had access to grade first, our, our dean of students had access to grade first, and this was a great tool in order to gather intelligence on students when they were having some challenges on campus. Another platform that we currently use, uh, this web focused solution is fed off of our, our, our Lucian banner system where unit heads and departments can gather data and kind of slice and dice it in terms of how they may need it in order to intervene uh, with, with students. So the large amounts of data, our Dean of Analytics is currently using this platform also to, to kind of develop our next version of our modeling. We developed over a year an eLife system. This is an in-house system. It is built on a uh, FileMaker platform. Uh, it was sp specifically built for housing and residential life. And what's happened over the years, we've built uh, additional models where now Student Activities uses this platform. Our Center for Community Engagement, our Dean of Students, and other stakeholders now have access to eLife. We understand and the research shows that if students are engaged, uh, with clubs and organizations and in their residence halls, they're more likely to be retained than if they're not. And this eLife platform allows us to kind of monitor what is going on with a student. So these are some, oops, some of the stakeholders on the left-hand side that feed the eLife platform. We have residence uh, assistants, we have um, housing directors, we have the Center for Community Engagement, we have student activities, and they feed eLife, which, and then the stakeholders on the right are some of the stakeholders that have access to this information to put together some intelligence and profiles when we get students that may be having some challenges at the institution. So the Dean of Students, we have the Student Conduct Office, our Counseling Center, the Wellness Center, and Accessibility are some of the stakeholders that uh, have access to our eLife platform. This is kind of a, a, a screenshot of what it looks like. It has some basic uh, biographical information, name, uh, where they live in the residence halls, emergency contact person, uh, age, uh, their academic status at, at the institution. And so this provides some general uh, information here. Um, this screen on the general, these are some of the drop down menus and additional screens that uh, staff on campus have access to. So we monitor a lot of the goings and comings and goings of these students. We have priority points. These are points that students get when they are involved in the residence halls programming. We know the student's schedule. 
what's going on with student activities, any clubs and organizations that they may be involved in. It's all monitored here. Center for Community Engagement, uh, our, a lot of our students spend thousands of hours in our community and we uh, monitor uh, their involvement with uh, community engagements. And again, some of the research that we've done internally shows that students who are involved, for instance, with uh, volunteering have a higher retention and GPA rate than students that do not participate. We also, over the years, a lot of our students are first generation, they come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, have challenges in terms of financials. So we developed a module for the financial. We have an occupancy management team that takes a look at students who may be experiencing financial challenges. Um, different stakeholders can make notations into the screen uh, in terms of conversations that they have with the students regarding their financial challenges. Our students are not able to, like many of your institutions, register uh, for courses if they have a balance or they're not able to return to housing the following semester if they don't resolve those financial matters. This is another activity of where uh, every student that's involved in a program in the residence hall, uh, again, our data shows that students, if they're involved in residential programming, they have a higher retention rate and a higher GPA. And this screen just shows uh, the level of involvement that this particular student has attended all of these events on campus. We know the times, we know the RA that was putting on the program, the title of the program, uh, the dates, and this is a way how they earn priority points. It gives them preferential treatment in terms of selecting housing for the following year. Student activities, again, clubs and organizations, are, do they have, this young man right here uh, is involved in several clubs and organizations. He also holds leadership positions. It tells me uh, what uh, events he, he attends on campus. Over the last couple of years, every event that we host in student affairs, when the students attend, they do a swipe. So it's kind of big brother, right? Uh, watching and monitoring what students are doing in terms of attendance. And again, um, our Dean of Analytics uh, has just requested this information to kind of see how she's gonna go about developing this model and student involvement is one of the var variables that she's looking at. Another system that we use is Maxient. This is a, a system that's off the shelf, it's a vendor, and this is to monitor um, uh, student conduct behavior. So again, RAs, um, the dean of students, housing directors can feed Maxient in order for us to uh, monitor student conduct. Uh, a lot of times student conduct behavior, whether it's mental health uh, or relationship issues, uh, are manifesting to um, a student that may be in distress and having some challenges and it allows us to intervene. So there's a case manager, the resident directors get involved in intervening. This is an example of what a screen may look like. In this particular report, we have an RA who's indicating that uh, two roommates are not getting along. And our goal is to make sure that students are not leaving the institution because they're having roommate con conflict, or as I refer to it, as drama. So um, that's just an example. We also have a tell somebody report. Anybody at the institution can provide us with data through this reporting system and it goes out and it gets triaged to uh, different areas. In this case, we have a faculty member who submitted a report that says that the student's having financial and mental health issues and, um, and, and it's looking for someone to try to connect this student to counseling and psychological services. So we have all of this technology, right? We have eLife, we have Maxient, we have tell somebody report and white focus. And so we have the student who may be in distress or who may need some assistance. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Bill Bassesi. Thank you. So we have all this technology. We have uh, all these ways to identify students that might be having some trouble, but I wanted to stop here uh, and tell you a little story it's got a lot of intrigue in it, political intrigue, leadership intrigue, educational intrigue. Uh, and so we'll get right to it. This is the breakdown for students right now at Eastern. It's not perfect, but what I went through and pulled was general uh, sense of the population and their GPAs. And if you notice, we're a predominantly white institution, uh, but we have a number of Hispanic students and African-American students. When students apply at Eastern, we ask the question, are you Hispanic or Latino? 
So it's a yes or no sort of answer there. If they say no, they have a chance to identify themselves in terms of multi-race. And so when we go and add Hispanic, Latino into those, we start to see a bigger population uh, at the institution. This is gonna be important a little bit later. They also have a pretty high GPA at Eastern right now. The, the educational gap between these two groups isn't too huge. This brings on some of the political intrigue that we'll get to in just a second. This is a breakdown of our Hispanic students uh, and multi-race students in state, out of state. Our out of state students' grades are, uh, the GPAs are higher. The in-state Hispanic students, GPAs are lower. There's a reason for this. So in 2016, Eastern uh, Connecticut State University and Delaware State University partnered with a private scholarship funder called the Dream US. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it at all. But it's a private fund um, and involved people like the Gates, uh, uh, the Graham family used to own the Washington uh, uh, newspaper, and uh, Jeff Bezos with Amazon. And what they did was they wanted to put some money into a fund to help students, uh, dreamer students, uh, undocumented students, get through school. And so it was a four-year, $80,000 scholarship that they offered these students. Uh, they're students from what we call lockout states, so those are states like South Carolina. Uh, for instance, I went to Clemson in South Carolina. I'm not too proud of it right now because in South Carolina, Clemson and uh, the University of South Carolina said, you can't attend our institution if you're an undocumented student at all. Uh, the same with Georgia, with the University of Georgia. But in other places, uh, what they did was say, you can attend, but you have to pay out-of-state tuition uh, if you're going, even if you went through grammar school and high school, and now you want to come to a Georgia college, you have to pay out-of-state tuition. And by the way, you're not eligible for any sort of financial aid uh, along the way. So we call those lockout states because those students simply weren't able to go uh, to college in their home states. And many of them, again, grew up, spent most of their lives uh, growing up as, as regular students, thinking of themselves as American, uh, may not even knowing their legal status until their 16th birthday. And the reason was they went to get license, they wanted to go get their license, and the family would have a discussion about uh, where they stood in terms of citizenship. So the first year we had these students, we have about 45 students come in in 2016. Now we have over 200, and we're expecting another uh, group in next year. This makes Eastern Connecticut State the third uh, the school with the third largest undocumented student population in the entire United States. Uh, so we're right, right, right up there with California and Texas schools, that they're all in one spot. So how this happened was I'm in my office one day and the provost comes in with the director of admissions and they shut the door and sit down in my office and say, we have a proposal for you. We wanna know if you wanna take on a new responsibility and they tell me all about the Dream US and the undocumented students, and it, it takes a second to, to sink in, and I said, absolutely. Uh, I'm never gonna get in the way of a student wanting to get their education, uh, and I, at that time, believed what, that these students should be on their way to citizenship, but didn't have a whole lot to do with it uh, at all. So they show up, this is, this is in May of 2016, this is just thrown at us. By August of 2016, they show up on our campus. Again, 45 students from different states all across the United States, thousands, away from, uh, thousands of miles away from their homes, away from their parents, worried about what's next. Some of them said, I wasn't sure this was real. I thought this might have been a trap uh, and that this was a big joke. Everybody was playing on us. So here's me, white, male, second generation from Italian family, nine brothers and sisters, and parents who all went to college. Uh, father's a physician, mother's got her master's, two of my brothers and sister have their degrees, uh, doctoral degrees. Multiple years of Spanish and Italian, I still can't speak any of it. I lived in Italy for a summer in 2011, and my Italian teacher would say, Bill, you are trying too hard to memorize words. She said, speak like Italians. 
speak fast, speak with feeling, and they'll understand what you're doing because we don't understand each other anyway. And by the way, when I dream now, I, can dream, I dream my uh, Spanish and Italian are perfect in my dreams. I just can't, can't bring it to my conscious mind. My background is academic advising. So if you know anything about advising, a lot of rules, a lot of structure, follow these things, you'll get through to graduation. Like data and technology, you heard, I worked with retention on campus, looking at different factors on campus about what was happening. And basically, the had the attitude of study hard, you'll get ahead. The university, uh, our president hired someone to assist us in our office, Maribel. Maribel is female, straight female, families from Puerto Rico. She speaks Spanish um, and very different in terms of our way of working with people. Uh, I was her supervisor, uh, but she's sort of, uh, you know, who, who cares about rules too much? Who cares about, you know, every day's a good day. Let's just have, let's have a good time. And so that was fine. I like her. I like, like her now and, and really admire her, but sometimes we clashed a little bit. And I was a little bit worried because here we have these 45 students that we're having to care for now. They might look alike to you <laughs> a little bit. Most of the population is Hispanic and Latino students. I don't want to uh, let you leave with the impression that all of them are because we actually have uh, undocumented students from India, Germany, um, you know, down in South America, Colombia, Brazil. Uh, you know, places, uh, Haiti, that you wouldn't think about all the time. Uh, but here they are, and I'm thinking, we're going to approach this as a structured program. We're going to approach this like we do everything else. We'll take care of these students. There won't be any problem. Uh, and we begin to clash a little bit. Um, I'm using technology. I'm developing uh, sort of these programs where we have to meet them. By the way, when we got this group, we can't treat them differently than any other group on campus. So we can't have, we couldn't have special programs for them. We couldn't do anything else that we wouldn't do for any other student. Uh, so instead of saying, you know, we're working with undocumented students, we would have meetings for out-of-state students. And we'd actually invite any out-of-state student to come to these meetings, uh, knowing full well these students were the ones that were going to come because it was a product of the uh, scholarship and they had to be, had to meet with us. My approach was, your will will get you through it. You'll work hard, you'll get through it. We'll meet, we'll talk about planning. Uh, and they gravitated towards both of us. So some gravitated toward me, they liked that. Most gravitated towards Maribel. Uh, and what I saw in her was she was spending time with students, sometimes I thought a little bit too much, um, outside of her office also. Uh, or inside the office, you know, the office would hear laughter and talking and she'd have four or five students in the group kind of acting almost as a surrogate parent sometimes. And so although I was frustrated as a, as a leader, I was also uh, had to play kind of a balancing act between the students seemed happy, they were responding to her, uh, they were achieving, and so maybe there was something to learn here. Uh, and by the way, I also see Dr. Diaz all over campus uh, meeting with students, often going to lunch with students uh, and, and meeting with them uh, over a lunch, and this is, again, for me, a little bit foreign from the way that I've gone through, uh, even in advising or management, uh, where we're ha we have more of a distance. I think I've set up more of a distance with students. What Maribel was teaching us, and what some of uh, you heard earlier today, is that I was learning at the time, becoming culturally responsive, and using this different approach to students. Uh, and understanding that they had attitudes different than me uh, and come from backgrounds different from me. And you heard about this earlier today, even in the last session, where you heard students say, I can't even see my student's picture. How am I supposed to work with this person? Or how can every, everything be online if I don't have some sort of uh, relationship here? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my dissertation. I'm finishing up my dissertation this semester. Don't run out of the room. I know it's against the rules to ask a grad student what their dissertation is about. But I wanted to study these students. I wanted to understand why are these students doing so well, this particular group of students. 
because everything that I'm studying about them, everything tells me they shouldn't be successful as they are. They're immigrants, that's a hit against them. Latino and Hispanic, uh, Hispanic students, in terms of the literature, hit against them. There's an achievement gap here. Most of them uh, don't come from very wealthy families, another hit against them. Uh, and these students especially are thousands of miles away from their parents and always worried about their parents maybe being uh, detained or, or taken out of the country. One of the things, uh, and again, for some of you, you know this full well, but I think this message has to get out to more colleges, uh, especially colleges that aren't Hispanic serving institutes, that the population in the US is changing. And it's changing in favor of Latino and Hispanic uh, people and, and students that are coming along the way. At the same time, we're looking at, uh, especially in the Northeast, where we're watching our enrollment rates drop because there just aren't people there. They're going up in Texas. They're going up where these populations are. In fact, uh, if, as you see, by 2018, uh, there are nearly 60 million Hispanic citizens in the United States. If you go to 2016, or 2018, if you go to 2016, does anyone here have an idea of how many voted in the presidential election in the entire United States? It's only about 135 million people voted. So you start to juxtapose this population against the balance that even of people that are even voting in the United States, and we start to see this is an important population we need to pay attention to. These are the students we need to recruit and we need to look at along the way because they're coming and we have to be prepared for them and let them know we're ready for them. Show, demonstrate to them uh, that we know about them. So the question I had with my students is what's going on here? What are the factors that make these students, you saw their GPA is so successful? Is it the money? Was it the, was it the money for school that put them through? These students could have gone to community colleges. Uh, they probably could have paid for some of that. Some couldn't. Some realized they were in meat packing plants and that would be it. That would be their future if they didn't make their way uh, to college. But not all of these students are uh, financially strapped. Did gender have something to do with it? We, I know that these, the females did better than the males. Uh, was there a problem here uh, or something going on with gender, with Hispanic and Latino populations? When we try to recruit, we try to get them through school. Some of them are dealing with other cultural issues where uh, the males may want to take care of family or may have, feel like they have to go to work. Uh, females will want, may want to start families or be close to their families. Here we had a group we had taken away from their families, again, thousands of miles away. It didn't make sense. Did culture itself play a part? Uh, did these students come from families that valued education uh, many of our students would say, you know, my parents came here so I could go to school. That's what pushed me through. Um, was it something about motivation for the future? Did they want to do something uh, to help their family later so they understood the investment of higher ed? All of these things, general intelligence, socioeconomic situations, uh, environment, these are my questions about what makes these students tick. So I go back to thinking about, look what Maribel is doing. Look who the students are gravitating toward. And the idea of familialism comes up. That this group, and you heard it earlier, um, is about family. They're about having uh, a group of people behind them, an environment uh, where everyone supports each other. Um, in my dissertation, I talk about this as the, as uh, their, their sort of, uh, I can't think of the, the right word for it, but circle. And I actually put into the dissertation this idea of a black hole, that I use the idea of a black hole in space that as students get into an environment, uh, and their ecology, that's what I was thinking about, Braun from Brenner's ecologies, gravity pulls that, that student towards a certain place in society, towards that certain ecology. If you don't know about black holes, 95, I think, percent of the light that falls into a black hole stays around the edge of a black hole, it doesn't go through the black hole. So anything that comes up with their ecology, start pulling them in, all those things, the negative factors, may keep them in that spot and they can't break through it. And I was, I was wondering, 
what pushes them then? So some light does go through a black hole and it's theorized that things get smashed down into a, a sort of a singularity where there's a moment in time uh, where, where mass is, is, is most dense. And it might be with these students that they get to a point of a yes and no situation, a positive or negative situation. And so when they have a family that's going to support them and a family saying education is the way you need to go and we're gonna make the sacrifices for you to get there, they make a positive yes decision. What's on the other side of a black hole is a white hole and it puts them out onto a whole new uh, sort of ecology. And it makes sense with these students that family would be so important. It's well documented. Family ties mean everything to the Hispanic student. And it can negate those experiences that happen to students along the way uh, to bring them back up to speed, to make them uh, feel better. We also know that with white students, familiarism, the familia is not as important. And even though this says uh, there's something about Mexican families, and, and my focus was just the Mexican students um, for my dissertation, that their parents also have to have schooling. I think that's more of a product of they understand the investment. And so then they know, you know, if, I'm in ed if, if I understand education, I want to invest in education, then they're going to push that student uh, to move forward. So when I was working with retention and when I was working with, uh, and we see the technology and student affairs now that surrounds a student, my first reaction to that is all of the predictive analytics, all of the technology, everything we're doing is worth nothing at the end of the day if they're not people there. And we're seeing this with these Dreamer students that they're going to respond to people like Maribel and Dr. Diaz. And by the way, they started to network around campus where they were getting faculty involved in their lives they were going, they were using our counseling, they were using the different offices, they got into student government, and what we started to see was that what they did was they transplanted what they had in their family, which they still had, to the university. And they made this big change uh, and found all of their support there. So instead of being a nobody, when that technology all uh, centers and says, here's the person you have to worry about, universities need to know, that's Jose. That's a person. The fact that he has an E accent on his name is important. So when we're putting documents together, when we're putting things in our computer systems, we might want to remember that. Because if that E doesn't have an accent, Jose is not feeling like this university knows who he is. And Jose needs to be circled not with Maxian, not with those different things that we've seen, but all the people in the different uh, areas of our division. So we've got all the people in housing, all the people in student activities and career services, uh, even in our, in our um, counseling center. And again, and we've got the Maribels and the Bills and the Dr. Diaz's trying to help them understand, hey, going to counseling is okay. And working with them through very real problems of, my parents don't want me to go on a antidepressant. They are not for that and to discuss the cultural issues that they're suffering through uh, in terms of being those American students growing up as they, where they feel very American, and, there's, and their parents at home who are also uh, bring their culture from the places that they've come from and then watching their children grow up. So there was a lot of stress there, um, but again, it's working through that. And in this case, Jose works with that it gets, he sets up, he sees that there's this new network here. And we have to use the people to reach out to him. It, this can't be where technology intercedes with us. It answers the question of why the student said, I can't see my, my professor's photo. They, he wants to build a relationship, wants to understand who it is that I'm working with. So there he is. This all turns into people. This all turns into relationships and a different kind of a family. So, and the board is meeting right now, so sometimes I think this message needs to go higher up, that we need to have all of our leadership understand that we can't treat students all the same way, that people that work on our campuses have to be taught about culture 
And that goes for everybody's culture along the way, and that we have to deal with students where they are and, what they're, and for what they're like. So it's a great tool for reaching students. We saw the picture earlier of all of our brand new students. All these tools are great uh, to come back and say, Anna is having trouble. We wouldn't have known that if the RA didn't put in a, put in a note and the note went out. We wouldn't have known that if one, one of Anna's friends who didn't want to uh, be known sent something and said, somebody please talk to my friend uh, about trouble she's having. It can't totally replace those face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, and we hope that even with the online things that there's some sort of outlet where students are facing their professors and talking to their professors through Skype. Our situation's different. We're an on-campus, we're a, you know, mostly live on campus uh, population, so we do have the ability to see students easily. And for leadership, uh, and this is what I'm getting my degree in, that leadership across the United States, not just Hispanic-serving institutions, have got to wake up to the population that's heading their way. We can't do things the same way we did 20, 30 years ago. We can't, uh, we have to start breaking into this achievement gap along the way. And the way we might do that is to understand our students and change our institutions. We can't rely on HSIs to do all of that with this population that's coming along. And then with those first generation students that I mentioned before, there's already acculturation issues that they might already be suffering through uh, along the way. I don't know that AI or technology can really address with the student how to negotiate all of those differences. Got one more. For Easton, this is a big deal. Uh, we have a, a president, uh, Dr. Nunez, whose family's from Puerto Rico. We have a vice president, whose family's from Puerto Rico. Uh, we want to serve more Latino and Hispanic students. Um, but we want to know how we do that, how we get those students that weren't in a special program the same attention that the students were in that special program. And that only meant Mari Bell and I were paying attention to them a little bit more. How do we get more faculty to understand those students' backgrounds when they're in the classroom uh, and know that there's a difference uh, between these students? As much as we tried to treat them like every other student, they did have an outlet in the two of us that here's my support. Here are these support people that I'm going to uh, kind of glom on to that are going to help me through here. And, they, and again, we were replacing people they knew in their family, in other schools, in middle school. They always have, they always talk to me about people that they didn't expect would help them, helping them along the way. I think Eastern can model a lot of this. We, we found out, a lot, I found out a lot about this along the way. These students are producing, again, good students, but they're, they're, be, they're GPAs that they're turning out year to year continue to be high-level GPAs. Uh, they continue to look each other for support. By the way, they're not all friends, but at the end of the day, we tell them this is a group you have to rely on, and they get support um, from that group. And then for Eastern also is to how do we translate the work we're doing so we can get, be a reflection of our community. Um, the population in Willimantic, Connecticut, where we're located, I would say the majority, or at least half to the majority, are Hispanic, Latino uh, citizens. And our school, our regional, one of four regional state schools in Connecticut, don't look like that population, when really, technically, they should be. Uh, how do we attract them when they're in the high schools around our area? How do they get the message that Eastern may be the better place for you to go? They may understand where you're coming from, be able to help you better. So we talk about uh, that, that in terms of our community. So one of the things I wanted to hit home is we talked about this and talked about how does technology help us. Uh, coming from a person that was is steeped in technology and data uh, to kind of be, kind of come against this uh, problem where I had somebody that working for me that sometimes it's okay to be outside of the classroom. Sometimes it's okay that you have some students giggling in your office for a little while, it's not, you know, as long as it isn't taken to some extreme, because we're creating this idea of family, that technology and all our predict predictive analytics won't do anything for us if at the end of the day they're not making and creating some relationship that propels them to graduation uh, and past that. Questions? 
Does everyone agree? I think it's a hard, it's a difficult for me because it's not a, I don't think it's a, it's a case that makes itself, but I don't think a lot of schools have put that into priorities yet, uh, where they want their faculty and staff to understand those things. Sure. So I do have a couple, well, question and comments within that. I am right now currently at an institution in Missouri in the Midwest, uh -huh. and I'm going through the initiatives of uh, trying to where your institution is at is having helping this Hispanic Latino youth have success at the university. Right now, I'm more so focuses in the recruitment side for that. Mm -hmm. But my biggest thing that I've seen, and you talked about it, this network of becoming like a second familia for this population. Uh, how did you collaborate with other offices to get kind of like that cultural competency of getting everyone on board on the same page that these students need a particular uh, way or approach for them to be successful while at the institution? Well, I think we had growing pains the first uh, year, the first two years, because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, we were so focused on the political question of them being citizens or not, that that's all we looked at. Uh, and we didn't start looking and start to see how do we get them uh, to engage more. We set up, the first couple of years, we set up a mentoring program with faculty. And again, the faculty came out of the woodwork, I have to say, and give them props for that, the, to help. But a lot of them wanted to help, again, because of the political side of it. But then they came out just thinking, this kid needs a coat because they came from Georgia and we're gonna have five feet of snow this winter. How do we do that? So faculty members started to develop that support. Uh, the students themselves started to develop uh, support. They started the Freedom Club. Uh, they got involved in our, um, our Latin Latino um, student club. So I think things like that once those start to be put in place, then other students hear about it. Because that had a lot to do with our recruiting later for students to actually apply. You would think that everybody would apply for this scholarship, but there was a, there's a lot of wariness about it. Like, what is this going to do if I had to put my name on something? So we don't share with anybody else any of their information. Um, in fact, we've stopped asking their, we stopped seeing that they have, if they have uh, DACA documents. We just wanna know, do you qualify for this program? Um, but it's really came, the students drove a lot of it along the way. And I think Mari Bell and I pushed it and different people on, on campus pushed it. So you look for those people who are the proponents that uh, start to engage. Um, and some of it for me, just personally, uh, coming out of my shell a little bit, a little bit as an introvert, um, we'd take them to an amusement park and I'd have Thanksgiving with them. And slowly the students would start to teach me about their cultures uh, and bring me into that culture. And so I always figured if we can do that with more people, that's what's gonna, and then you start to see just what wonderful, you know, what this wonderful group is all about. And very different, I would think, than my white students, generally, and sharing things with me. Thank you. I would just like to add to that, that in student affairs, we, we tend to do more training and, and workshops for our professional staff. So we were very intentional. Um, and as a vice president and as a Latino, right, you, my staff is predominantly white, so I have to navigate that diversity training and that and cultural competency that we need to embed in our staff so that it's not, you know, okay, there goes Walter again with another culturally competency workshop or speaker or consultant, but very intentional uh, in delivering those type of um, trainings and programs for our staff, and we would invite staff from the academic affairs to, to incorporate that. Some of this was also driven by students. I mean, recently I just met with the Freedom at Eastern, and we did this training maybe two years ago, and they are demanding, right, that we do another training for, uh, for our staff. The other piece is that we're a feeder for graduate programs in higher ed and student counseling personnel and whatever name they, uh, that we give. And, and we give back feedback to these programs to make sure that they continue to have cultural competency, whether it's counseling or programs or the curriculum reflects the, you know, changing demographics so that when we're hiring talent, that they come in with some cultural competency if they're not professionals of color. Anything else? Thank you for hanging in there and being with us.